Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us for this year's edition of the Global Nuclear Science and Engineering Commencement. People from around the world are participating in this event. To ensure a stable connection, and considering the large number of attendees, your video and audio functions have been disabled. There will be a short question and answer session at the end of today's ceremony. You've already sent more questions than we have time for, so thank you. Please note that we may only have time for a couple of questions at the end, so we may not be able to get to yours and we will not be able to answer questions in writing. Please stay till the end of the commencement for the opportunity to submit a quote on your experience today. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be made available online in the near future. Now a few words of welcome from one of our young graduates, Catherine Obasasan. Hello everyone. It's an honor to welcome you to the second annual Global Nuclear Science and Engineering Commencement, hosted by the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, or in short, the NEA. My name is Catherine Obisasan, and I am the 2020 to 2022 Junior Policy Analyst, Young Associate at the NEA, and also a recent college graduate myself. In May 2020, I graduated from the University of Maryland with a bachelor's degree in international relations and economics. And like much of you, my commencement was held virtually. Being a recent graduate in current times, I've come to understand the value of celebration. Celebrations serve as both a send off from your community and a reminder from those who contributed to your success that you're ready to embark on the next part of your journey. With the context of COVID-19, it is important students still receive this send off and reminder. With this in mind, the NA has gathered a group of accomplished professionals from the nuclear community to let you know that your work has not gone unnoticed. I now only give the floor to the Director General, William D. Magwood IV. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located around the world. Welcome to the second of the Global Commencement for Nuclear Engineering. My name is uh, Bill Magwood. I'm Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency. And it's a true pleasure to be here today to welcome you to this special event. With COVID-19 raging still across the world, it's very difficult for universities to hold their traditional commencement ceremonies. These ceremonies are very important. They both celebrate the accomplishments the students have made in completing their studies, and also give them important words of advice to move forward into their careers. Because of COVID-19, many of these ceremonies have been canceled. However, we at the Nuclear Energy Agency have concluded that there is a value in recognizing the accomplishments of those who have been through the difficult studies of nuclear engineering and nuclear science and other areas related to nuclear technology. These areas are very difficult under the best circumstances. Under these circumstances, it's even more difficult. But across the world, hundreds if not thousands of you have accomplished. And so to that, congratulations. Congratulations on the hard work. Congratulations on completing a very unique area of study, one that many people find too difficult, but you are among the elite and you have completed your studies. So congratulations. And for those of you who are moving into professional careers, we look forward to welcoming you within, to the, within the nuclear sector. Today, you're gonna to hear from a series of speakers. And these speakers were selected because they provide a diversity of views about nuclear technology and where your talents can be best applied. And they will all have special advice for you. I, for myself, have been working in the nuclear sector for all of my professional career, which is about 4 million years now. And in that time, I have served both in industry and in government and in regulation and now today is Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency in the multilateral organization. Through all those experiences, I can tell you that I don't think in all the years that I've been involved in this business that there has been more exciting a time than there is today. There's more innovation, more new thinking in the nuclear sector today than there has been maybe since the 1950s when nuclear was born. Those of you who are graduating into this field now are embarking on a great adventure, one of the likes of which we've not seen in a great many years, one that shows that nuclear energy is part of the solution to many of the world's problems. 
of course, among those problems include climate change, which we will talk about a great deal today because that is the, the theme of this global commencement. The challenge of climate change is one that is very challenging in the respect that, that the difficulty that we will all face in reducing CO2 emissions to net zero by about 2050, it really requires changes to society the likes of which we've really never seen before. We're not talking about doing something that perhaps we did 10 years ago or, or 30 years ago. We're doing something similar to what happened 50 years ago. This has never happened before. We've never asked society to change this dramatically. And in that respect, a lot of new thinking is necessary. And among the new thinking is new thinking in the nuclear area. Now, why is nuclear important in this respect? Well, I'll give you my personal view. When I look at what's happened in, during this COVID crisis, I have seen that we have had to switch from driving to work to teleconferencing. We've had to stop flying airplanes and go to video conferences like this one. Children around the world have had to be educated through the internet instead of going to school. Families for entertainment have turned to streaming. Now, all this requires electricity. And it really symbolizes something which I think policymakers around the world are beginning to understand, that we in this century are more reliant on electricity than any generation before us. And the truth is, it's going to get even more intensive in terms of our reliance on electricity, because industries around the world are electrifying. They're moving away from the use of fossil fuels, moving towards electrification, which really runs hand in hand with digitalization, which of course is another transformational activity underway. And transportation is moving, it seems like in inevitably towards electrical vehicles as opposed to gas powered, gas, gasoline and petrol fired vehicles. These are huge changes in society, but they also show that reliance on electricity around the world is going to grow, electricity demand is going to grow. And if we're trying to reduce the impact on the environment at the same time, then there are not many options that we have before us. We at the NEA believe that nuclear is a big part of the solution. That nuclear energy, which today, right now, is the largest source of clean energy in OECD countries and in the larger economies around the world. And globally, nuclear is the second largest contributor to electricity that, that does not emit greenhouse gases. Nuclear energy is the only non-emitting technology that's dispatchable and expandable. And we believe that if you're serious about climate change, you have to look at nuclear power. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to build nuclear power plants in every country. Don't think that'll happen. Don't think it should happen. But many countries are looking at building nuclear plants and expect that in combination with renewables, that this provides a very clear pathway to net zero emissions of carbon. So in that context, you are graduating. And those of you who are moving into the field, we're going to find that the opportunities, the challenges, the discussions ahead are going to be extraordinarily exciting. I, for myself, look forward to seeing the contributions that all of you make. It's time for new thinking, it's time for innovation. And as always, younger people come in with new ideas and new ways of doing business. You will change the society around you and you will change the nuclear industry. And I think it will change it for the better. Today, you're going to hear from first our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Lester, who is a chair of the newly founded Global Forum on Nuclear Education, Technology, Science, and Policy, which is hosted by the Nuclear Energy Agency. Professor Lester is also Associate Provost at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he oversees the Institute's international activities. He'll talk a little bit more about the Global Forum, but the Global Forum is an exciting new initiative that provides for the first time a global framework for cooperation among academics, academicians that are working in the nuclear sector, something we're very excited about. After Professor Lesser, you will hear from Karen Astra-Halbert, who will give a, the charge to the graduates. 
She is professor of physics at the Balsero Institute and research director of the Bariloche Atomic Center in Argentina. She's also won the 2019 L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. On behalf of industry, you'll hear from John, Hop John Hopkins, who's chairman and CEO of the Advanced Small Modular Reactor Technology Development Company known as New Scale Power, who is going to deliver a, a salute from the industry. These are very exciting speakers, and you're going to hear more from others as the day goes on. But for now, I will give the floor to Richard for his opening keynote. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to everyone around the world for attending this event. To our graduates, it's fitting that we should be celebrating your accomplishments today on a global scale in this global ceremony. Because your achievement in successfully overcoming the obstacles imposed by the pandemic will stand the test of time. You've already earned at least a footnote in history. But it's also fitting because the challenge you're all facing now as you begin your careers, the challenge of climate change, is a global challenge. And if you succeed in meeting that challenge, it will truly be a historic achievement. I'll return to this point, but first, let me introduce myself. I'm Richard Lester, and I'm Associate Provost at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I also serve as chair of the newly formed Council of Advisors of the Global Forum on Nuclear Education, Science, Technology, and Policy. The purpose of this new forum is to build bridges between the worldwide nuclear academic community the students and professors in your universities and the nuclear policymakers in all of the countries you've come from. For my whole career, I've been a professor of nuclear science and engineering, and it's been my privilege to work with generations of students and to see what they've been able to do to push the limits of the possible in our field. And now by working with the Global Nuclear Forum, I'm able to see for myself how educators in other countries around the world prepare their students for a nuclear future. Every country has its own approach, of course, but you won't be surprised to hear that there are many similarities and commonalities. After all, the laws of nuclear science and engineering don't change when you cross national borders. But what has also been apparent to me is a different kind of commonality that many nuclear students around the world, regardless of their home country, want to contribute to the ongoing fight against climate change. And they, or I should say you, are uniquely well positioned to do so. We know that climate change is one of the greatest challenges we face, both in terms of its potential impacts on the planet and on our societies, and in terms of the sheer scale of the international cooperation needed to tackle it. To achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions later this century, we'll need to pursue two tracks simultaneously and at fast forward speed. On track one, we need to go as far as we can, as fast as we can with the technologies and policies we have now. On track two, we need to invest in, invent, and deploy new technologies and tools. And nuclear science and technology will play a crucial role on both tracks. On track one, existing nuclear technologies will be essential to achieving rapid reductions in carbon emissions from the power grid, as long as they can be operated safely and economically. On track two, new nuclear technologies both fission and fusion will very likely be needed for deeper reductions in carbon emissions, not just for a carbon neutral power grid, but also for tackling the other 60% of global carbon emissions that don't originate from the electric power sector, importantly, including the industrial sector, and perhaps also to provide the immense amounts of zero carbon energy that will be needed to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which many assessments say will be essential to augment the effort to reduce emissions if we're to achieve the net zero goal. Carrying forward nuclear along both of these tracks starts with you. 
You have spent the past several years learning and applying new knowledge. You've asked questions. You've come up with new ideas. You've developed new skills. And perhaps you've changed your minds about some things. Indeed, I hope you have changed your minds about some things. In any case, because of the central role of nuclear, your studies have given you the tools to serve on the front lines of the struggle to prevent the worst consequences of climate change. This is important work, and we, your teachers, ask you to take action on it. In making this request of you, we don't speak with moral authority because our generation has ignored this problem for too long. Nevertheless, we're counting on you to help harness the extraordinary potential of nuclear science and technology to contribute to decarbonization and to make a better world. As I speak to you today, I cannot help but think back to my own nuclear graduation. At that time, there was another existential threat facing the world, the nuclear arms race. In that case too, graduates in nuclear science and engineering were called on to make an important contribution to overcoming a global threat. And that threat aroused the same kind of fear and outrage among young people that we see today about climate change. The nuclear arms race persists today, of course, but although many people didn't predict this at that time, it has been managed. My fervent hope is that this generation of nuclear graduates, your generation, will do at least as well in overcoming the climate challenge. And so to conclude, today I speak on behalf of all of your teachers in warmly congratulating you on your success as young graduates in our field. And I wish you continued success as you embark on your careers for all of our sakes. Thank you, and again, many congratulations. Thank you very much, Richard, and I greatly appreciate um, your, your comments. And, and again, thank you for uh, being the first chair of the Council of Advisors to the Global Forum of Nuclear Education. It's going to be a very exciting and very important opportunity to bring the academic community around the world together. Um, and I particularly appreciate your um, comparison between the Cold War of the past and the climate uh, change crisis. Because uh, yes, you're right, there is the same kind of emotion that goes into these from many people. But I think it's also worth pointing out that um, if you look at the resources that were expended during the Cold War, we've not come close to approaching that um, in the current crisis. So it'll be interesting to see how things develop in the coming years. Our next speaker um, is going to be giving the, um, the charge to the graduates. And this will be given by Karen Hallberg. And um, Karen, looking forward to your remarks, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I'd like to first thank uh, the NEA Director General, William Magwood, for his very kind introduction. It is a tremendous honor for me to have been invited to speak at this momentous occasion. I congratulate you all for this achievement. Of course, you must feel fulfilled, proud and happy to have completed an important step in your lives. Remembering my own graduation, I recall I felt a mixture of accomplishment, of relief, and above all, of deep gratitude to all those who had supported and helped me and trained us during our career. I also remember feeling anxious about what will come. In that moment, I recall the words of my grandpa, uh, an English railway engineer who immigrated to Argentina in the beginning of last century. Um, when I graduated, he told me very seriously, enjoy this moment in which all your future lies ahead. Mine, instead, my future already lies behind me. So, carpe diem, enjoy what you've achieved to now and look ahead with optimism compromise and responsibility. And here's what I'd like to stop and reflect on this last word, responsibility. You have received a tough training 
you have studied and have acquired knowledge, you are now prepared uh, to be experts in your fields. And this knowledge is precisely what will give you power and authority, what will enable you to contribute to the well-being and to impact on the lives of people throughout the world. So it is important to realize that this knowledge should be used in a responsible and ethical manner. Your professional work should be guided by the same ethical values that apply in everyday life, including intellectual honesty, fairness, objectivity, openness, respect for others and trustworthiness with yourselves, with your colleagues, students and institutions, and also with the general public. You should also serve as role models for your future students and for fellow researchers and professionals, and you should exemplify responsible practices in your teaching and in your professional lives. To encourage young nuclear engineers and physicists at my home institution, um, in, in Bariloche, at the Balseiro Institute in Bariloche in Argentina, where to encourage these young students to reflect on their values, we offer them the possibility of taking an ethical oath in the same spirit of the medical Hippocratic Oath, which reads, I promise to work for a better world where science and technology are used in socially responsible ways. I will not use my education for any purpose intended to harm human beings or the environment. And before acting, I will consider the ethical implications of my work. I take this oath because I accept that individual responsibility is the first step on the path to peace. So, well, uh, the challenges, you know, the challenges ahead are formidable. And as young and promising professionals, you have a very important role to play. Several of those challenges stem from decades ago, and others are more recent. Let me tell you, for example, way back in 1955, and concerned about the uncontrolled and, the, and or the tremendous release of energy and destructive power of the explosions of hydrogen bombs, Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell wrote a beautiful manifesto in which they urged scientists, technologists, and policymakers to reflect on the consequences of new technologies on humanity and on the environment, and to imagine new ways to solve conflicts, mainly relying on rational thinking and the dialogue. As a consequence of this manifesto, the Russell Einstein Manifesto, there was a first meeting in a small town of Pagwash in Canada, and this led to the currently known Pagwash Conferences for Science and World Affairs, which was awarded together with one of, of its founders, uh, the nuclear physicist Joseph Rodblatt. It was awarded the Peace Nobel Prize in 1995 for their efforts to diminish the part played by nuclear arms in international politics and in the longer run to eliminate such arms. In addition to these uh, uh, old problems, but still very uh, very current. Uh, in addition to that, we're now facing important challenges posed by the relentless degradation of our environment, and we're witnessing the direct consequences of climate change. We are ourselves generating. And here is where your role becomes even more relevant. You can contribute to curb this trend and to ensure a sustainable future for everybody on this planet. This is also part of your responsibility. So to conclude, let me recall the final words of the Russell Einstein Manifesto, which has served me as a guide in my professional and private life. It reads the following. We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. I wish you all an intense and happy life. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Hallberg, and thank your your comments are, were very, um, very, very thought provoking. I mean, we often speak about the special responsibility that um, scientists and engineers have in all that they do, but particularly in the nuclear area, and we focus greatly um, in our framework 
on the need for everyone in the nuclear sector to take personal responsibility for uh, for nuclear safety and to uh, understand that everything they do, no matter what their role is, um, contributes to that. So um, all of you out there listening, think very carefully about this. You're embarking into a, a field um, that does have special responsibilities. And I, I appreciate uh, Professor Hallberg's um, you know, sobering thoughts on that kind of um, so now um, we've heard from we've heard the keynote from uh, from from Richard Lester. We've heard the charge uh, to the graduates from uh, Karen Hallberg, and now we're going to hear from a CEO. We're going to hear from John Hopkins, who is the chairman and chief executive officer officer of New Scale Power. I'm a long term colleague, um, and I'm sure he'll have some very interesting comments to make. So, John, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Director General Magwood, for that kind introduction. Hello and congratulations to you and your loved ones on this momentous achievement. It's my great honor to deliver commencement remarks today for this incredible group of graduates from all over the world. It has been a challenging year to say the least, and you all should be extremely proud of your accomplishments during these unprecedented times. As countries around the world look to improve energy efficiency and sustainability, our future engineers, nuclear scientists and technology innovators, which are all of you, can have a real and positive impact where it matters most improving the quality of life for billions of people who need electricity, who need clean air and water, and who need economic growth. And by working to stop climate change, one of the most pressing challenges of our time. As we shift our energy consumption away from greenhouse gas emitting power sources, that exasperate the effects of climate change, we must invest in clean sources of energy that will remain resilient in the face of our changing environment. And as countries around the world rethink and rebuild their critical energy infrastructure, the resiliency, safety, and economic benefits of nuclear energy are a true game changer. As leaders in the nuclear field, we will look to you for the solutions that will bring us closer to a carbon-free future. I am confident that each and every one of you can bring about that critical change. At New Skill, we don't view the solution to climate change as a one-size-fits-all, zero-sum game. We truly need all of the above, renewables, nuclear, hydro, and more, if we're going to mitigate the disastrous effects of climate change successfully. Furthermore, we recognize that the next generation of nuclear power plants must adapt to climate changes, including an increased frequency of extreme weather events. It will be your challenge and responsibility to carry on this vital role nuclear energy plays in our lives currently and bring it into the 21st century. As you know, New Scale has developed a game-changing nuclear power plant rooted in the fully factory fabricated New Scale power module capable of generating 77 megawatts of electricity using a safer, smaller and scalable version of pressurized light water reactor technology. Our design offers the benefits of carbon-free nuclear power while reducing the financial and siting commitments associated with traditional large-scale facilities. Our largest scalable power plant can house up to 12 modules, providing up to 924 megawatts. Our scalable power plant design allows investments in generating capacity to be right size for the application at hand and provides the flexibility to grow over time. Our SMRs can provide zero carbon, high capacity base load and an extensive load following power to integrate with intermittent renewable energy sources like wind and solar, reducing the need for fossil based capacity firming power. New scale plants can change power generation using the highly maneuverable core design or for rapid changes in power output a turbine bypass feature. With this technology, zero carbon options like wind and solar can thrive without relying on fossil-based generation or expensive battery storage while maintaining grid stability. New Scale's SMR was designed deliberately by, for operational flexibility to facilitate decarbonization of a diverse range of non-electrical applications, including water desalination, district heating, and hydrogen production. While fossil fuels have traditionally powered these applications, the new scale plant provides a reliable zero carbon power alternative. 
Since 2012, NewScale has engaged in more than 20 research projects at a geographically diverse number of universities, including two international universities, and we continue to engage in new R&D opportunities. The growing relationship between NewScale and the academic community is a natural partnership spurred by a mutual spirit of imagination, creativity, and innovation. Thanks to the nuclear science, technology, and engineering experts like all of you, NewScale is advancing towards the commercialization and deployment of its first-of-a-kind advanced nuclear reactor by the end of this decade and hopefully sooner. Despite the many challenges we have faced due to the pandemic, 2020 was actually a big year for advanced nuclear and especially New Skill. In August 2020, we made history as the first and only small module reactor to receive design approval from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC. To add a bit more color to this incredible accomplishment, New Skill's 12,000 page design certification application took more than 2 million engineering hours, involved more than 800 people, and cost in excess of $500 million U.S. to prepare. We are also preparing for our first deployment project for our customer, the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, UAMPS, and its carbon-free power project, which will be located at the U.S. Department of Energy's Idaho National Laboratory site. The new scale power plant will generate electricity for UAMPS customers in Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, and Idaho. Again, our success and ability to deliver on a cleaner future for all our communities is in a big part thanks to graduates like yourselves. The promise of advanced nuclear energy is a global one. We have memorandums of understanding to examine the deployment of new scale SMRs in 12 countries around the world. We see nuclear energy and SMR development on a global scale in the path forward for our company's success and for the betterment of humankind. I hope you see the same opportunities in your prospects, thanks to nuclear engineering. An exciting career, opportunities for innovation, and personal enrichment aligns with your own goals and aspirations to help make our world a better one. We must all work to demonstrate how cleaner and safer advanced nuclear designs can bring numerous benefits, economic and environmental, to countries around the world as they seek innovative paths to complete a clean energy transition. As you move on to the next phase in your career, you join an incredible community of nuclear experts, engineers, and advocates that are there to support you and to learn from you and work with you to bring about a better, more sustainable future. You are graduating at an exciting and crucial time for nuclear energy. There is much work to be done, but I am confident that all of you are ready to take on this important charge. While a challenge before us looms large, I have no doubt that each of you will play a part in building a cleaner, healthier, and more hopeful future for people around the world. Congratulations on all your work and good luck. Thank you very much, John. And I particularly appreciate the fact that you highlighted a very important aspect of the work that you're doing, which is that the advanced technology that New School Power has um, has designed um, is coming to market soon. This is not a, you know, the, the thought many people have is that advanced nuclear is decades away. Um, New scale is perhaps a handful of years away, you know, before the end of this, this decade. So that shows that these technologies are coming to the market very, very soon. So this is not the long-term future we're talking about. So thank you for your, your remarks. And my thanks to all the, um, the keynote speakers today, um, Richard, Karen, uh, John, and Karen will be joining us later um, for the panel discussion. So again, thank all of, uh, thank all of you for your, um, for your very, uh, very, very, very insightful comments. So we're gonna move on to the panel session. Um, in addition to uh, Professor Hallberg, who spoke already this morning, um, we're going to also hear uh, from Louis Martin Vega, who is the Dean of Engineering at North Carolina State University, uh, Pushkar Karaka, who is the Deputy Director of the Climate Science Awareness and Solutions Program at Columbia University, 
Jessica Lovering, who is the co-founder and executive, um, co-executive director of the Good Energy Collective. And uh, last but not least, uh, Larissa Shasko, who is the climate change and energy policy researcher um, and PhD student at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, first, uh, Professor Vega, uh, or excuse me, Dean Vega, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Director General Magwood. Uh, can you see me well? Yes, we see you. Okay, thank you very well. Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm, I'm also very pleased and honored to be here today. I really want to thank uh, the Nuclear Ener Energy Agency for this opportunity to be a part of this really uh, very singular and, and a very special event that you've put together for all of the graduates of nuclear engineering and nuclear sciences around the world. Um, let me also echo the comments of the prior speakers. My sincere congratulations to each and every one of the graduates who are on this uh, link today, uh, everybody who's taken time to join us. Uh, as, as many of the prior speakers have already said, uh, being able to obtain a degree in nuclear engineering or nuclear sciences is, is very difficult even during normal times. And these are not been normal times for sure. Um, all of you have overcome major disruptions in, in teaching, in research, your ability to work in groups, but most of all, major disruptions in your personal lives. The challenges that all of you have had to face are in many ways unprecedented. So I applaud your resilience, uh, everything that you've demonstrated during these difficult times, and trust in this experience, as challenging as it has been, will really serve you well as you start your careers, either in industry, academia, or government. While it might be difficult at times to envision the pathways that your lives may take, what I can guarantee you is that a degree in engineering and your degree in nuclear engineering or nuclear sciences really provides you with an excellent platform for a large variety of career opportunities. This was certainly the case for me when you know, my engineering degree became a springboard, not only for a career as an engineering educator and researcher, but also for a broad set of experiences in the private sector, in government, and as a consulting engineer. Little did I imagine when I was where you are right now, that these experiences would even take me to Antarctica and the South Pole, an opportunity that presented itself when I was honored to serve as the head of the engineering directorate at the US National Science Foundation. None of this would have happened without a degree in engineering. As the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us, our planet is more interconnected than ever, and the challenges we face have no national borders. In the decades to come, we need to work on a lot of things to ensure that the next global pandemic won't be as deadly and disruptive as the one that we're dealing with now. We need to assert a future that will be one with clean air and water, adequate sanitation, plentiful food supply, and most of all, clean, reliable energy available to all, and especially those in rapidly growing developing worlds. Our greatest challenge is to accomplish all of this in the face of a climate crisis that is forcing us to alter the way that we're used to living in our developed world, especially when it comes to energy generation. Now, I think that most, if not all of you would agree that there really is no one silver bullet that will ever resolve our global energy and climate change challenges. But nonetheless, as Bill Gates has expressed in his book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, it is hard to foresee a future where we decarbonize our power grid affordably without using more nuclear power. Since nuclear plants are also number one, when it comes to effectively using materials like cement, steel, and gas, he concludes that all the cheapest paths to zero carbon involve using a power source that is clean and always available. In other words, nuclear power. So you can see that each and every one of you as nuclear engineers and scientists are not only well positioned, but you have a very special role and responsibility to play in assuring the sustainability of our planet. At the end of the day, assuring a sustainable, healthy, and secure planet for all mankind has to be our ultimate goal. 
This is a goal that all of us at North Carolina State University are working on every day and certainly our Department of Nuclear Engineering. NC State is home to one of the nation's leading departments of nuclear engineering. We have a long and storied history. The first university in the US to offer a PhD in nuclear engineering and the first to open a nuclear reactor on a college campus. The latest one, Polestar, is what you can see in my background. And it's one of the most utilized university reactors in the US and internationally. Our faculty members and students are working to maximize not only the lifespan of current reactors, but also leading research and development in next generation light water reactors. Our faculty have also established teaming agreements with TerraPower, X Energy, GE, Hitachi, and others to make the next generation of reactors a reality in the near future. Our nuclear engineering department is also a global leader in plasma science and engineering and in nuclear nonproliferation. And this provides our faculty and students many opportunities already to make a major impact on the safety and quality of life of people around the world. I'm very proud of their work and very proud that our college is home to such a prominent and internationally recognized nuclear engineering program. As I mentioned previously, your degree in nuclear engineering, rather than limiting your life options, really expands them. It is a tremendous platform for career opportunities that you might never even imagine at this moment. Our nuclear engineering alumni have taken leadership roles at local, national, and global levels in many areas, nuclear power generation and others. And that shows the depth and breadth of opportunities available in this field. And what I wanna do is share quickly three examples of nuclear engineering alumni at NC State so you can see their career paths. Ray Odierno, Ray Odierno is an individual who earned his master's degree in nuclear engineering at NC State, but shortly after receiving this degree in his government and military career, he was assigned to be a main US liaison in global nuclear nonproliferation talks and events in the European theater. These experiences, because of his background in nuclear engineering, catalyzed a very quick rise in his responsibilities and propelled him to a very distinguished military career, where eventually General Odierno rose to be a four-star general and chief of staff of the US Army, which is the highest position you can have in the US in this domain. The second alumni is Linda Butler. Linda Butler earned her bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from NC State, then went on to do a master's degree in medical physics, and then a degree in medicine. After years in private practice, Dr. Butler is now the chief medical officer at Rex Healthcare, one of the largest hospital systems in North Carolina, where she and her team were leaders in addressing many of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic in the state of North Carolina. When Linda is asked oftentimes about her background, people will note that they are more impressed, she tells me, by her degree in nuclear engineering than her degree in medicine. I think they understand how difficult it must have been, but that was the platform that she started from. And then finally, Alan Eisenhower was also a graduate of our nuclear engineering program at NC State, went on to be a commissioned officer in the US Navy, but after leaving the Navy, he joined Oak Ridge National Laboratories, went on to do graduate work in nuclear engineering at the University of Tennessee, and has had a long and distinguished career at Oak Ridge National Labs, where he is now the deputy director and chief operating officer of the whole institution. So these are just three examples of the type of leadership roles and careers taken on by nuclear engineers. I just want you to know that you should feel confident that you have the education and skills to face any problem and take on any task. Go forward with the knowledge that even when there is still a lot in your future that needs to be defined, you have a platform. You're working from a platform that's going to enable you to be the one who does a lot of this defining and empowering what you do. So finally, my exhortation is for you to go forward with the following virtues. Go forward with the thought of excellence in everything that you do. Perseverance in the fact that you need to persevere through the hardest of times. You've already done this in many ways because of the pandemic. 
Be bold in the way you address things in the future. Be optimistic about what you can accomplish. And most of all, maintain the level of humility that is so necessary to make sure that you do actually achieve the things that need to be achieved, understanding that it's not so much about you, but about what you can do for humanity. Let these virtues guide your path forward as true engineers to convert ideas into reality, provide solutions to global and societal grand challenges, and contribute in significant ways to the welfare of all mankind. Take care. Sincere congratulations again on everything that you've achieved. I look forward to hearing great things about you and your accomplishments in the future. Take care. God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Dean Martin Vega, thank you very much. And I particularly appreciate the, the high, way you highlight the versatility of nuclear engineers. I've known many nuclear engineers over the course of my career. And as you pointed out, including many of the ones you mentioned, including Alan Eisenhower, who I know pretty well. Um, these are people who um, have a huge amount of versatility. And, um, and, I, and I, I do think we need them for energy these days. We have an energy issue to deal with. Um, our next speaker um, is Pushkar uh, Karacha from the Earth Institute, Columbia University. Um, so we'll move right along to that. So um, please, um, Pushkar, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, can you all confirm that you can hear and see me okay? We hear you and we see you. Okay, great. So thanks, uh, Director General Magwood, and thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. And congratulations to all of you graduates. What an exciting time to be involved in the energy field. So being a climate scientist, I want to begin by briefly outlining some big picture climate change context. We now have overwhelming evidence that virtually all climate change since the 1950s is caused by humans, primarily fossil fuel burning, secondarily land use, mainly deforestation. We're already witnessing widespread damaging impacts to societies and ecosystems all over the world, which are almost certain to get worse if current trends continue. The large physical inertia of the climate system implies that large scale changes will be very difficult to reverse the longer we wait to act. Thus the combined scale and urgency of the human caused climate crisis represent an unprecedented challenge to human civilization. As an aside, very similar statements are true for the closely related crisis of outdoor air pollution which is also caused largely by fossil fuel burning and which leads to around 5 million premature deaths per year globally. For optimism, fundamentally, we know how to solve the problem. Namely, within the next few decades, we must scale up clean energy sources by as much as possible while phasing out fossil fuel emissions, along with land use improvements like reducing deforestation and enhancing ecosystem restoration. We should also be optimistic because despite the ongoing pandemic, we're all incredibly lucky to be living at a pivotal moment in human history. Because of the large inertia of both the climate system and world energy infrastructure, the choices we make this decade and the next will reverberate for centuries, if not millennia. It might surprise many of you to know that despite the great complexity of the Earth's climate system, the biggest sources of uncertainty and long-term projections of climate change are actually near-term national energy choices. But the bottom line requirement is very certain. The world needs every proven large-scale non-fossil energy source that it can get in the near term. And this brings me to nuclear power and the crucial role it has played and all of you could possibly play and the, the crucial role nuclear could continue to play in the near future if it's given a fair chance. Many of you might be familiar with a peer-reviewed scientific paper I published in 2013, co-authored by Jim Hansen, in which we analyzed a simple counterfactual scenario. What would have happened if nuclear power never existed? I got the idea to write that paper after witnessing the widespread backlash against nuclear from much of the world public and some governments following the Fukushima accident. We found that because nuclear does not emit greenhouse gases or toxic air pollutants, it prevented massive amounts of mortality and emissions that would have resulted from fossil fuel burning. Using the same methodology as in that paper, I recently extrapolated our numbers based on the latest available energy data. And I found that over the past 50 years, nuclear power has prevented over two and a half million air pollution induced premature deaths and over 90 gigatons of CO2 emissions globally. That's the equivalent of hundreds of large coal power plants never having been built, 
or in other words, the past 57 years of coal burning in the US, the world's second largest coal user in recent decades. In addition, by mid-century, projected nuclear power can prevent up to 7 million premature deaths and over 200 gigatons of more CO2 emissions if it continues to displace coal. Jumping ahead a few years, many of you might not be as familiar with a peer-reviewed paper I published in 2019, co-authored by another colleague, Makiko Sato. We analyzed energy, electricity, and CO2 emission changes in Japan and Germany after Fukushima, and found that if these countries had reduced their coal and gas power instead of nuclear, they could have together prevented about 28,000 air pollution-induced premature deaths and over two gigatons of CO2 emissions in the first seven years after the accident. These lost opportunities provide useful lessons, especially the prime importance of curtailing fossil fuels instead of a major clean source like nuclear. For example, if Germany had simply paused its nuclear phase out and reduced its coal power instead, it could have prevented up to 16,000 premature air pollution induced deaths and one gigatons of CO2 emissions by 2035. Likewise, the US and the rest of Western Europe can each avoid 100,000 premature deaths and about seven gigatons of CO2 emissions if they too cut coal instead of nuclear in the near term. Thus, our papers and many others demonstrate that without nuclear power, it would have been even harder to mitigate the climate and air pollution crises because the energy it supplied almost certainly would have come from fossil fuels, overwhelmingly coal, which caused much higher air pollution related energy produced. The final topic I'd like to briefly discuss is the role of nuclear power as assessed in the IPCC's special report on global warming of one and a half degrees Celsius, published in 2018. This report analyzed 85 scenarios that limit global temperature to one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial by 2100. In most of these scenarios, nuclear's role in the world energy mix increases very substantially. For example, roughly doubles between now and 2050. Thus, it's clear that nuclear will remain a very important energy source through most of this century, especially in the critical time frame for climate change mitigation, i.e. the next two to three decades. Similar findings are presented in the IEA's report on net zero emissions by 2050, published just a few weeks ago. In closing, I offer some brief words of advice. Avoid getting caught up in false and counterproductive dichotomies. The solution to the climate crisis will almost certainly not be 100% renewables, but nor will it be 100% nuclear. The energy mix of a given region will have to be customized based on whatever works there. Remember, the scale and urgency of the crisis require that all proven non-fossil energy sources must be kept on the table. So as you enter the workforce or academia, don't hesitate to advocate for nuclear as a clean energy source, along with solar and wind. And lastly, I hope you always pursue your goals with the greater good in mind. Nuclear power has done a great service for humanity, and I hope all of you feel privileged to be part of its continued development. Thanks for your attention and best wishes for the future. Well, thank you very much for, for, your, um, for, for your analysis. It's very, very interesting to hear those numbers. And I, I particularly appreciated um, you know, your, 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 your observation that it's never going to be just nuclear, not just renewables, but we really need um, both, and that's that, and, and I think also your your note that, um, that really every country has to do the analysis to find out what they need, what the proportions are right for them. That also meets uh, fits what we've done at the NEA, and and, and a lot of the analysis we've done um, shows that we really have to look at this on a on a on a local basis, a country by country basis, uh, to see what makes sense for for each economy. So thank you for making those comments, um, Jessica. You can come back now. Uh, <laughs> um, and and our, our next speaker is Jeff, Jessica Lovering, the co-founder of the Good Energy Collective. Jessica, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. And um, so thank you to the Director General for that introduction and for inviting me to address you today. Um, since I was asked to speak in the year that I also graduated, I can only assume this means that I'm the global valid Victorian, right? I'm kidding. Uh, I know I'm just the salutatorian this year. But either way, um, finishing my PhD in engineering and public policy comes as somewhat of a surprise, uh, considering that I actually dropped out of a different PhD program over 10 years ago. And what changed for me in the intermediate years was that I found a problem I was really passionate about working to address, which is climate change. 
and a specific solution set that seemed to have no shortage of aspects that needed research. That would be nuclear energy. So whether the path that you took to your degree was smooth sailing or was interrupted by many beyond design basis events, uh, I hope that you're all just so, so proud because the past year and a half was unprecedented on every level and we all managed to persevere. As much as I always dreamed of defending my dissertation, I never thought that I would be doing that defense in my living room over Zoom. I'm sure I'm not alone uh, this year, but hey, we made it. And while the past year was full of disappointment and heartbreak, we are starting to turn the corner and there's actually a lot to be excited about going forward, both for nuclear energy and for addressing climate change. So last year saw the first of four reactors come online in the UAE with continued progress on construction for the very first nuclear power plants in Bangladesh and Turkey. In the US, we have our first generation three nuclear reactor at an AP1000 uh, expected to come online this year. And we also have the advanced reactor demonstration program, which funded two companies to demonstrate their technology in the next five to seven, seven years. In parallel, we've seen some really exciting progress on tackling climate change uh, with US President Biden committing to full decarbonization of the power sector by 2035 and net zero emissions economy wide by 2050. But ultimately the success or failure of nuclear to contribute to the fight against catastrophic climate change won't depend on any technological innovation or any specific policy. It will depend on radical transformation in the institutions that govern and promote the technology. And that's where you guys come in. So when I was in the home stretch of my PhD, I was looking at where I might work afterward. And I just couldn't find a place where I could do the type of nuclear policy work that I felt would have an impact. And I wanted to launch my career somewhere that was focused on nuclear energy as one of many tools to fight climate change, but also that took issues of justice seriously. So as a solution, I ended up founding a new org called Good Energy Collective, along with some other amazing folks um, who shared this vision of building a new kind of workplace. There are so many wonderful organizations already working in nuclear, and I'm sure some of you are lucky to be joining one of them soon. But you may need to also forge your own path within these institutions to help you transform them into the kinds of organizations that we're gonna need going forward. Think about it this way. We have less than 30 years to fully decarbonize the global energy system. Those 30 years are also gonna be the bulk of your careers. So each of you has a really unique opportunity to contribute, yes, but also to transform the system within itself. Because as COVID-19 has exposed, climate change is not the only global challenge we are facing. We are also facing economic inequality, racial injustice, global poverty, and we're increasingly aware how interconnected all of these issues are. And this is where you, as early career nuclear professionals, have such a valuable role to play. You can bring a fresh perspective and the energy to work on these challenging and interrelated problems. We need to build workplaces that are more diverse, more inclusive, and more equitable. But we also need to reimagine what it means to work on nuclear. When building your teams, you don't just need sharp scientists and engineers to be successful. You're going to need sociologists, psychologists, and historians. To build new nuclear projects, you won't just need the right technology or the right business plan or the right communication strategy, but you're gonna need a community engagement plan. And that plan needs to share power and decision-making with the local community to ensure that risks are well understood and benefits are fairly distributed. And that's where your role as early career professionals is so important. From my perspective, we have a wealth of experience to learn from in the older generation, but there is so much value and it's often underappreciated from the early career graduates. You don't just bring energy and fresh ideas, but also an openness and willingness to challenge the status quo. So I'd like to congratulate all of our nuclear science and engineering graduates again, because you persevered through this challenging time and are now well prepared to face all of the opportunities along with the obstacles that you'll come across in your careers. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lovering. I didn't realize that. Congratulations. That's, that's, that's <laughs> thank fantastic. You. And, I, and I, want, I wanted to, well, one thing you said really, um, really captured me, which was your comments about um, that we have to change the mindset when it comes to en engaging stakeholders and make it them part of the decision making. We, we've come to that same conclusion. We've had some uh, extensive workshops um, that have focused on this. And that seems to be the lesson that is now proliferating, to use a word, um, throughout the nuclear sector, that, that it's not just a matter of communicating with stakeholders, it's involving them in the decisions. And, and that's gonna require skill sets that sometimes engineers don't necessarily bring with them. But so I think that uh, many, many, um, uh, uh, Professor Lester could speak to this um, if he were with us in the global forum. That is one of the conversations that has been had in the context of the global forum, that, that there needs to be a broader approach to educating nuclear engineers in the future because of these new skill sets that they need. So thank you for highlighting that. Now, the final speaker for the panel discussion is Larissa Shasko, a PhD student um, who is coming to us from the University of Saskatchewan. And I think, Larissa, you were one of the first panelists we had on a webinar when the COVID crisis began. So you've, uh, you've, you've come full circle. So we have you back. I'm pleased to see you. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, DJ Magwood, for the warm introduction and for the opportunity to be here today for this day of celebration. I'm very excited to have the chance to speak to everyone who is in attendance. First off, congratulations to my fellow graduating class of 2021. Graduation is, at the best of times, a major accomplishment, but this year, during this time of great uncertainty, it's also a sign of resiliency. Building resiliency is not easy, but it is pivotal to our ability to survive the climate change crisis. While there are no vaccines for climate change, there are solutions. And each one of us who is graduating and entering our careers in the field of nuclear energy are part of the climate change solution. I always think back to something one of my first academic mentors said, that anything can be researched, anything can be studied, but so what? Whether or not we think about it directly in the work that we are doing, climate change is our collective so what? Nuclear energy has an essential role in lowering global greenhouse gas emissions while simultaneously supplying energy for economic and social development. The skills we offer as new graduates will help to maximize the climate change mitigation potential of nuclear energy through cross-disciplinary research and international partnerships. I know it's hard to comprehend that just as the world emerges from one period of crisis, another major threat to humanity still requires immediate attention. The years ahead will be full of great challenges, but also great opportunities. And the ability that we have shown to persevere as the class of 2021 is an immense sign of hope that we can and will implement the solutions to make our planet a greener, healthier place for everyone for many generations to come. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about how some places in the world have been much harder hit by COVID-19 than others. The same is true with the climate crisis. Just before the world entered the global pandemic, massive wildfires raged in Australia, causing an estimated 1 billion animals to perish, in addition to many human lives and homes lost in the devastation. I remember thinking, wow, one billion animals and finding it almost impossible to process what that meant. Whether it is climate change, COVID-19, the health of our oceans or energy poverty, we are a global community and we realize that now more than ever. I'm proud of the leadership my home country of Canada has shown in supporting development of small modular reactors as a climate change solution while fostering a culture of transparency, openness, and collaborative action. The more we work together, the better off we will adapt and overcome this next period of uncertainty. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to be apart, but has also brought us all closer together. 
During the past year, I had the opportunity to participate as a fellow of the NEA's Nuclear Education, Skills, and Technology Framework. For my fellowship, I took part in the Small Modular Reactor Hackathon, which was a fast-paced five-day virtual event in August of 2020. We were placed into teams with students from different academic backgrounds and geographical locations than our own. A big part of the event was looking at how small modular reactors can solve real world problems. The strength of the ideas that emerged showed that online platforms can help us work more collaboratively at an international level. This event was the perfect chance to connect with nuclear energy experts and other early career professionals from around the world who collectively agree that nuclear energy is cool and can help cool the planet. When I participated in the hackathon, I was just finishing up my master's degree in public policy. I started the PhD of public policy program just a week after I successfully defended my master's thesis. It has been a busy year. I'm sure my fellow graduates would agree. For my PhD research, I'm now working on enabling the development of a youth-led engagement strategy for energy policy, climate change, and SMRs. I hope to encourage and support more youth to choose careers as STEM and social science researchers who can contribute to implementing the energy system decisions that are made today. I am excited to see so many mentors and those of us becoming future mentors at today's event. Finding ways to foster intergenerational transfers of knowledge can help advance policy solutions to climate change and energy insecurity where advanced nuclear energy has an important role to play. It's an exciting time to be alive. Not every generation gets a chance to enter their careers at the start of the most major and rapid global energy system transition ever experienced. We literally get to design the future right now. Energy systems are extremely path dependent, a path dependency that we are about to see disrupted, opening doors to deployment of innovative low carbon technologies like small modular reactors. Energy system transition also opens doors to achieving energy justice for all, ending energy poverty, and improving quality of life and the health of the global population. While the in-person celebrations will still come, virtual celebrations like this are amazing in their own way. We are now more connected than ever before and the skills we have to offer as early career professionals in the field of nuclear energy have never been more important than they are today. For all of these reasons and many more, I am so excited to be here today to wish all my fellow graduates and those entering their careers a huge congratulations on this major achievement in our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very interested in hearing more about this initiative that you've started uh, with the youth driven uh, movement. So the, perhaps there's some, some engagement we can have with you on that. So thank, my thanks to all the panel. Let me ask all of you to come on camera, um, in, including uh, Professor Hallberg. Um, we'll have our, our panel discussion because we do have questions flying in. Um, I'm, all, I'm already painfully aware that we'll never get to all these questions. There's just not enough time. But uh, again, thank you for all your, your comments. L let me start with this question, because I think it's a very good question. Um, as we are um, thinking about this future where nuclear can play a large role, we're going to need people. We're going to need trained people like the people we're speaking to today. But uh, do we have enough of those trained people? And if we don't, what do we have to do to get more students to come into nuclear science and technology? Perhaps, uh, Professor Hallberg, you want to give uh, the first first comment to that question. Thank you very much for this very important question. Uh, 
I, I think it's it's fundamental to get many more young people like all of you here in us uh, right now, and and especially women. Uh, we haven't spoken about that, but I think it's very important to have many many more more women. We need more more young people in general. In particular, we also need more women. So the numbers in engineering are still low. Uh, worldwide, there are few less than thirty percent women working in in the science and engineering. So I welcome all the women that are here. Of course, I also welcome all the young people, but this is very important. What to do with this? I think uh, it's very important to have a, a, a meetings like this one, to have role models like the young speakers we had today. And I think that this is a, like a virtual circle where if we have more women and role models and women that also inspire others, we will have more of them. And we also need young people, as we said, to inspire others with their, with their work and their, uh, and their role model and um, an example. Well, I, I appreciate that. And as, as I think you know, we, we at the NEA have some very important initiatives going on right now to try to address those issues. And, um, and let me say, I think that you're a fantastic role model. So we're, we don't be surprised if we call you and haul you across the world to go meet young, young people, because I think you're a fantastic role model for them. Um, may, maybe um, maybe Dean, Dean Martin Vega, maybe you'd like to comment on this as well. Yeah, yeah, what do sure. You think? Yeah, well, I, I think, first of all, let me echo what Karen has said. And, and for us, that's been very critical, Karen. We've noticed a big difference since we have now have two women faculty members in our department, right, which we're very proud of as well. Uh, but a couple of things, Bill. One, uh, alternate pathways. We have, uh, our department has created a number of minors in nuclear engineering that students in other engineering fields are taking, you know, their degree in mechanical, but they're getting a minor in nuclear. But the most important thing is, I think we've got to start well before people come to the university, all right? Um, we have a significant number of programs that we do, K through 12 summer programs in engineering in all different fields. And I know this is gonna sound, but we started with high school, it's now middle school, elementary school. We even have them for young people who are deaf and have certain disabilities. We need to infuse the concepts and understandings of nuclear engineering into that domain much more, okay? Um, it's almost too late sometimes if somebody comes to the university and they have no idea about the field or whatever, it still becomes a discovery field as many people talk about it. So that would be my thought. And maybe, you know, the efforts of the NEA and others can play into that because uh, our nuclear engineering department does have a one week summer program and, you know, over the years, we find that that, you know, has been a, a pathway of sorts. But to be honest with you, even late high school is almost too late. I mean, middle school becomes a very, very critical domain for creating an awareness. And the awareness is not the word nuclear. It's what we're talking about today. It's what this field does and its importance in addressing the societal issues of climate change and energy and so on, because that's the, that's the conversation that you have at, at, at those levels. So uh, that, that would be my thought, Bill. That would be my yeah, thought. I, I appreciate that comment very much. And I think your observation about the age of the students is something we've seen as well. I think some of you know, we hold these international mentoring workshops, which, um, which are aimed at high school um, students um, and, and more, more often not high school girls because um, right. they, they drop off the scope very quickly if you don't reach them at an early age because they get discouraged and are told that they, they shouldn't be engineers they should be something else and so it's really important to get to those messages as soon as possible so so I appreciate the, the comment um, let, let me go to a, a question that came in for dr karacha because i think this is a very important question um, you, you pointed out that nuclear can play a big role in dealing with with climate change but not all countries, at least I think the way people think about today, are prepared to build nuclear plants today. You know, we, we, nuclear building, building a, a, a conventional nuclear power plant is a big, complicated um, project that even countries like the United States uh, struggle with. Um, if, so if you talk about you know, small countries with small economies or, or emerging economies, how do they participate in this? What's, what's your thought about that? Yeah, first of all, yeah, that is an interesting question. Um, my only answer would be, first of all, backing up to what I mentioned in the remarks, which is that uh, 
you know, it's okay if a country doesn't pursue nuclear power, right? Uh, the energy mix of a given region really needs to be customized to whatever works there. And therefore, if nuclear, if they decide they don't want nuclear for whatever reason, uh, cost or whatever other issue, um, then that's fine. We can involve them in climate change mitigation in other ways. Uh, to point out that in terms of the global emissions, um, developing countries at this point, uh, this is going to change, of course, as, as, they, uh, as they become more energy intensive. But at this point, many, if not most developing countries, their, their land use emissions are actually higher than their energy sector emissions. So one way we can engage them is by encouraging them to uh, make land use improvements. So in other words, reducing deforestation, enhancing uh, reforestation and other forms of ecosystem restoration. So even if we don't involve them in the energy sector transition, we can still you know, either do technology transfer to help them realize the benefits of nuclear and other clean energy technologies or as I mentioned, just to do the energy sector and then have them be partnered, part, you know, have them partner with us in, in making land use improvements, which is really where it's needed most anyway. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, let me go to Dr. Levery. Um, you, you, you've been working this climate issue for, for quite a number of years now. It's something that I know you're very passionate about. Um, and let me ask you a really unfair question. Um, if we fail, if we fail to meet the climate challenge, um, what will what will have been the reason? Why did we fail? Oh, <laughs> that is a hard question. Um, I I think it will have been a, a lack of vision or planning on um, accelerating deployment of solutions um, and, and policy changes. I don't think it will be a, a failure of technology that we, you know, we didn't have the technologies we needed. I think it'll be more on the, the larger scale um, policy side and from uh, our, our decision makers and our political leaders. When, when I was listening to um, Dr. Um, uh, Karacha's comments about the, the numbers of of deaths because uh, that would have happened if nuclear hadn't been here. Um, and then the deaths that did take place because nuclear wasn't used as much as it could have been. I, I wonder how much do you, do you think nu the nuclear conversation plays into the success or failure quotient? Do you, would you, is, it, is it unfair to say that, um, that this, the fact that nuclear is not being considered by some countries um, is, is, uh, is, is making the failure quotient more likely? Yeah, I would say absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's already a very big challenge to decarbonize to reduce emissions. And we really need all the technologies that are available. Um, so any, any sort of um, uh, opposition or ideological feelings around certain energy technologies uh, is slowing us down. So we really want everyone working together, everything getting deployed as fast as it can. Um, and I think that, you know, in particular, we've seen that it's very helpful to have these large firm sources of clean energy, whether it's nuclear, or hydro, even geothermal, um, that can help balance the system. And so uh, I would just love to see, you know, from people working in nuclear, more conversation around how do we help all the other clean energy sources? How do we integrate into this broader climate change agenda um, rather than just promote our own technology? And hopefully we'll, we'll see the reciprocal of that from the other clean energy sources. Yeah. So solve the problem. Don't promote your own favorite technology. Yep. <laughs> there's, there, there's a unique thought, right? Um, Larissa, let me ask you a question because it is a, it's a couple of different versions of this, but I'm going to direct it at you, um, which is a very, very, very elemental question. What, what's exciting about this when you, when, you, when you have this conversation? What really makes you um, excited and, and optimistic that we can deal with all these issues? What, 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 is there something you can encapsulate that talks about why you're excited by all this? I think it's, well, I guess the opportunities are endless. And uh, I've talked about the path dependency. Well, it's it's very, I think we very much inherit the energy systems of future generations, but that all has to change so quickly. 
Uh, and there's so many issues that do need to be addressed. So I think like the energy poverty and the poverty that we see around the world is something that I think from the time I remember being a very young child and wanting to do something about that. And I think that it's uh, what's exciting to me is that as we address this huge crisis that is changing everything that we do in our lives, we can actually emerge on the other side with a world that is more just and, and equitable for everyone, uh, not just for those of us who are currently doing okay. Um, and I think too, there's this opportunity for the younger generations to really pave out a future that, uh, that we don't really know what, uh, what, what that is going to look like yet. It's um, the, the uncertainties. I think we've, we've really dealt with this, this idea of uncertainty being something that is stressful. There's also uh, a lot of, of excitement that can come in that uncertainty because uh, of the unknown possibilities. Uh, and I think that one thing I find is that by, by being part of the solution, it helps to deal with some of that um, anxiety or worry that would otherwise be there. Uh, and that I think is really important for younger generations that they know that there is uh, every reason to be hopeful um, in, in the world that we can build. Well, thank you for that. Very, very well said. Um, so our, our time is evaporated um, as I knew it would. Uh, it always seems to happen this way. So let me ask each of you to give a very brief uh, closing comment and closing message to the graduates. Uh, Professor Halberg, let me start with you. Well, uh, thank you so much again. And uh, my, my final word is that I'm very hopeful for the future. I'm an optimistic, but uh, we, we really rely on all of you. Uh, so uh, I'm so happy you are you're in the professional lives and we really do, we, we have uh, our these very big challenges include uh, that include climate change, energy and poverty. So as a woman scientist from the developing world, I, I'm really looking forward to your contribution to, to uh, solving or to uh, contributing to fighting uh, these important issues. Remember, we need to learn to think in a new way. Remember your humanity, like Russell and Einstein said. And uh, well, congratulations and thank you again for, for your future contribution. Excellent. And thank you again for joining us. Um, Dean Martin Vega, please. Well, you know, simply uh, just to uh, just to reiterate, I think what a lot of us have shared uh, that that you go forward, right? That the graduates would go forward, understanding that you do have a very very important role to play here. I think one of the things, and I think Jessica, you were hinting at this, is there's a real urgency with this, right? There's a real urgency with this, and perhaps many of the graduates actually see and understand that better than many others, but that you can play a role in this from day one. You know, Don't feel that you have to wait to get to a certain point and play a role in the biggest way possible, not within a particular niche, but it isn't just the nuclear engineering graduate or the nuclear engineering scientist, it's the issue of climate change. It's the issue of the sustainability of our planet and that you are really poised to play a major role in this. So plunge into this as quickly as you can uh, we need you to do this. We really need your help to do this as quickly as possible. I agree. Thank you for that for that comment. Uh, Dr. Karacha, please. Yeah, so in, uh, yeah, first of all, congratulations and best wishes again to all of you graduates. Uh, uh, the main thing I'd, I'd close with is just to encourage all of you to get involved in, in candid energy related discussions uh, whenever possible. Uh, for example, whether it's with family, friends, uh, colleagues, and so on. And uh, just remind them that all energy sources have pros and cons, right? So it's really unwise to disproportionately focus on the downsides of one energy source, whatever it is. In this case, we're talking about nuclear, uh, which unfortunately gets a very bad rap, but disproportionately so relative to the other clean energy sources. Uh, and just remind them that uh, if, if there are nuclear skeptics out there, just remind them that the downsides of current generation nuclear technology are largely resolvable, right, by the... I think we lost the last phrase there, but thank you for, for that anyway. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Lovren, your turn. Yeah, I, 
I would say my my last piece of advice is just for people or the new graduates to get out of your comfort zone, particularly with regard to discipline and field. Um, you may be well trained engineers, but try to find, you know, social scientists and practitioners to collaborate with and and see what you can learn from them as well. And, uh, you know, help get outside of your lane a little bit and that'll lead to more successful projects overall. Good advice. I agree with that. And last but not least, uh, Larissa Shasko, please. Well, be hopeful, be determined, be relentless, and believe in yourselves, and be excited about what you can offer to climate change mitigation through the career path that we've chosen. Share your enthusiasm with your friends, family, social media, and beyond. The general public is looking to the scientific community for leadership, so speak up and don't be afraid to be the thought leaders and innovators that the world needs right now. I think as experts, we sometimes forget that not everyone realizes the important role that nuclear energy has to play in solving the climate change crisis. So the more we can communicate this potential in ways that foster open-mindedness, the more hope we can offer the public and future generations. Thank you very much. Um, now they've allowed for me to take, take to spend a few minutes to uh, give my closing, but we're really out of time, but I'll, so I'll be very brief. And I'll just simply say, I would, I would pass along three messages to any graduates, particularly these graduates. Um, first and foremost, um, have fun. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, you're not doing the right thing. That, that to me, that's the single most important thing about, about anything that you pursue as a career. Um, the second is make a difference. What are, whatever you do, make a difference. You know, make it significant. It's your life. You only get one of them. But make it matter. And the third one, and this sometimes gets me in trouble, is rules are made to be broken. Um, if you follow the rules your whole life, you'll, you may not ever innovate anything. And I, I'm a firm believer in, in breaking a few rules here and there, as my my staff probably knows. Um, but again, panel, thank you very much. Um, appreciate all your remarks. And we're going to conclude uh, with, uh, with uh, a message from Catherine, our, our own uh, recent graduate, um, who will also introduce a final message um, of inspiration. So Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Magoy. Then thank you to our panelists once more for joining us today. Um, all of your remarks were great. But just before we close, I have um, just an announcement for all of our participants. Um, as mentioned at the start of commencement, you will now see in the chat a link for a feedback survey on the event. At the conclusion of the survey, there is an opportunity to share a few words on your thoughts and feelings on the commencement, as well as the commencement theme, the role of early nuclear graduates in the fight against climate change. Selected quotes derived from the survey will be highlighted and disseminated on NEA platforms. And please follow the survey instructions to potentially be selected. As a final words of farewell, we have a quote by Jim Hansen, read by our panelist, Dr. Pushkar Karacha. Greetings from the US. My name is Dr. Pushkar Karacha. I'm a climate scientist with the Columbia University Earth Institute, where I serve as the deputy director of the Climate Science Awareness and Solutions Program. The director of our research program, my colleague and mentor, Dr. Jim Hansen, was unable to participate in today's event, but he wanted me to share the following statement with all of you graduates. Modern nuclear power has the potential to make life better for people, to help us restore a healthy climate, and to allow more space on our planet for other species. The nuclear industry needs more bright young people, like all of you, to help make these things happen in the 21st century. If I were a young person, that's the field I would enter today. So on both his and my behalf, I wish all of you all the best with all of your future endeavors. Thank you very much to our distinguished speakers and panelists, and many thanks to all who listened in. We appreciate your participation. Today's global commencement has been recorded and will be available online in the coming days. Make sure you follow the NA on Twitter and LinkedIn to keep in touch with us and receive updates on events like this one. Thank you and goodbye for now.